Okay, so for the recording, welcome everybody to our May 17th um, teaching and learning and UX call. Um, I forgot to send out the reminder yesterday, so I'm not sure how many folks will get, but um, for those of you who are here, thank you for attending. <laughs> So today um, we'll just we'll start off with a few announcements and I don't see Miguel here. So usually he does like a 15 minute demo of whatever his group has been working on. But since I don't see him here today, um, we will skip that. Um, the other thing that I had on the agenda was a discussion about uh, non numeric grading types. So specs, gradings, ungrading, that sort of thing. Um, and we bumped it to this week because we ran out of time at our last call because um, we had a couple demos last time. So uh, so we'll talk about that this time. And then uh, we can also, if we, if we have time at the end of the call, which I expect we probably will, we can also go over a few JIRAs. So um, let me go ahead and I'll put a strike through the... EDF updates since I don't see Miguel. Um, all right, so in terms of welcome, um, just a reminder about SakaiCon, registration is open. So if you've not registered, please do. Uh, it is free to register, but um, we do want a head count for folks that are going to be there in person for you know planning any on site events. And also for the folks attending virtually, we need a way to contact you to give you the login information and reminders and stuff about the event. So, um, so please register if you plan to attend. And again, it's uh, July 18th and 19th. That's a Tuesday and a Wednesday. And for the folks that are going in person, um, there'll be some pre-conference um, gathering uh, on Monday, um, probably afternoon, evening activities on that Monday before the conference. So, um, Wilma, before we move on from SakaiCon, um, mm -hmm. could I put in a plug to this group? Um, sure. I, we, we would love some help identifying more instructors for the teaching showcase that's going to take place on Tuesday, July 18th. So we have two. Uh, we were hoping for four. We've got a couple of asks out, but and uh, one of them, one of the two is uh, is a faculty member that, that Christina identified. So Christina, thank you for that. So we have uh, we have Christina's instructor and one other, but would love some help. So I know uh, Leanne, I've been in touch with Jordan about trying to ask around a little bit at, at Pepperdine. I don't know if you have any ideas. The intent is not to put you on the spot at this moment, but just to uh, ask if you could help. So I can I can be more explicit about the expectations for the instructors and the timing and what they would need to do and when it would be. But, uh, you know, in general, we'd like them to, in the space of seven, quiet, <laughs> Siri has something to say, in the space of uh, you know five <laughs> to seven minutes, show off a really good, a really innovative course or a really good course practice uh, that Sakai helps enable. I think Siri had a suggestion. <laughs> uh, no, Siri is not being helpful. <laughs> Siri likes to likes to speak to me. Um, yes, yeah, so if you attended SakaiCon last year, you'll remember the uh, the Teaching with the Stars showcase where we had four different faculty, um, and then our two super fans. Um, so it's going to be a similar format. So if you're curious about what you know the ask would be, you can also watch the video from last year to give you an idea of what we're going for, because basically we want kind of the same sort of session, but just different showcases. So it's not a repeat. Jeremy, is there someone from LAMP that hasn't spoken in the past um, that you would like to put forward? It's a, it, it's a great opportunity for instructors to show off great stuff that they're doing. Uh, not that I can think of right now, Josh, I'll, I'll consider that and think on it okay thank you um no no pressure but i you know I'm, I'm here to ask so thanks for giving it some thought okay any other announcements or um anything you guys want to add to the agenda nope all righty so um 
We will go on then to um, to dive into the non-numeric grading topic. So this is actually, let me, let me share my screen. Um, like a million windows open. Let me close a few things out. All right, so you guys should be seeing my screen, right? So this is the Etherpad for today. Um, so uh, the non-numeric grading topic was something that uh, has been of interest to a few people kind of over the last, I don't know, couple years of uh, ways to do this in Sakai, ways that you can kind of approximate it using the current uh, feature set. But then um, we also had some questions um, that were posed to uh, Longsite from um, some of the folks at Pepperdine. They had some faculty that were exploring these types of things and wanted to know about ways that we could potentially enhance Sakai to make it easier to implement these types of grading strategies. So, um, so that's kind of where this concept document started. Um, so I wrote up um, some, let me go back to the beginning. I had scrolled ahead to link, open to a couple of links. So this is a concept doc, just kind of documenting our, our thinking as far as um, specs grading and uh, what we would like to see in terms of enhancements. I'm gonna paste that into the chat in case you wanna open it up. It's also in the Etherpad. So um, you should have, I believe, comment access on this. So if you have any thoughts, um, feel free to, to chime in either on chat or with your microphone, but um, you can also come back to this later and put comments on the document itself if you have any thoughts you're able to comment. So, um, so the idea with this um, non-numeric grading concept document is to better support um, different types of grading. So I kind of, I'm not going to document, you guys can certainly do that if you like. I'll try to just sort of summarize what's here and then skip ahead a little bit. Um, so uh, there are some links in the references, references section. Getting a little bit of a feedback. Um, okay. Um, so in the references section, if you wanted to read more about any of these, I, I put together a few links that um, kind of explain what some of these different grading types are. But, um, but I've summarized them here. Uh, kind of as quick, uh, you know, concisely as I could. So specifications grading is the idea where you define some criteria um, for different types of work that are required throughout the semester and everything's graded pass fail. So there's no like partial credit. There's no, you know, scale of one to a hundred. It's just you either complete it satisfactorily or you don't. Um, and if you meet all of the criteria that are set out for that bundle of, of coursework, then you get the grade that's associated with it. So it kind of simplifies a lot of the bargaining that happens in grading and a lot of the, the justification that you have to sometimes give to students for why they got a certain grade or didn't get a certain grade. Um, and it gives people a little more control over the grade that they want to go for because they um, can kind of see very clearly what they need to do um, because it's it's very carefully specified. So if you're interested in more reading more about this, there's a couple of um, resources that I'll point you to in spe specifically. Um, the first is uh, the specifications of grading. There's a book by um, Linda B. Nelson. You can get it on Amazon um, for like around 20 bucks for the e-version and 30 or 35 for the, the paperback. You also might find it in your campus library. A lot of libraries carry it. Um, but basically, this goes into a lot more detail about um, how to do specifications grading, some different examples. Um, and um, she actually wrote an article for Inside Higher Ed a few years back that kind of summarizes the book. So if you don't want to buy the book or you just want sort of the cliff notes to the book, <laughs> you can read the Inside Higher Ed article 
which is also linked there in that references section. Uh, yes, Virginia, there's a better way to grade, which kind of goes through the, through the highlights of, of what specifications grading is and how to kind of implement it. And it doesn't have to be an all or nothing um, implementation. You can just sort of take pieces of it to implement in your course, um, the ones that make the most sense for you. So I'm just kind of scrolling down to show you. It, it talks about the bundles and things like that. Another concept in um, specs grading is the idea of tokens so that everything's pass or fail or you know all or nothing um, that you, do, you give people tokens that they can use for a retake or a revi revision on an assignment um, so you give them a set number for the semester and they can spend them however they want um, and then maybe you give like a as a reward for people that don't use any of their tokens um, maybe they can skip something at the end so um, Anyway, so that's kind of the idea behind specs grading. Another um, kind of non-numeric grading method that has, um, this one's been around for quite some time, but um, it, it's, it's not easily supported in a lot of learning management systems is holistic grading, where you're just kind of grading the overall quality. So you're basically just assigning a letter grade. You're not giving points. Um, so while you can do letter grades in, um, in the LMS, sometimes it's, it's hard to just assign a letter grade for like an assignment or a quiz because those are all sort of point based. Um, so what holistic grading typically employs is like um, examples. So you have an example of A quality work, B quality work, etc. And um, people compare a submission to the model and you know whichever model it most closely matches that's the one that they give the you know the a the b the whatever this is used a lot in um types of uh, like standardized test grading like um gre uh essay grading that kind of thing um so you know it's something that's been around for a while but again it it's used basically grade more quickly when you have a lot of typically written uh, work to score um, because you're not providing a lot of um, detail on the minutia. You're just sort of um, identifying the overall quality of the, the work as a whole. That's why it's called holistic. Um, and then the other type of grading scheme that again is, is kind of a non-numeric scheme because it doesn't translate well to scores in a grade book um, is ungrading. And if you've not heard of this, this is a little newer, um, but it's, it's a pretty interesting um, idea that it's it's kind of the philosophy is that grades are artificial um they're kind of arbitrary i mean if you think about it they really are and um and that focusing so much on a score is, is taking away the intrinsic motivation that people have to learn so, um, and that's it kind of feeds into the reason why people cheat because they're not interested in the learning they're just interested in the grade and the credential at the end um, so they don't care if they learn or not and they're willing to, to cheat to get the grade when really they're cheating themselves because they're not getting the knowledge um, so the idea of ungrading is that you sort of divorce your classwork from the concept of giving it a score and you just provide really detailed back over the current course of the semester <clears throat> on each assignment. It's not that you're not providing feedback, it's just you're not giving them a number grade. Um, and you just kind of workshop it um, the entire you know length of, of the term. Um, and then you provide feedback at each you know um, iteration. And then when you get to the end of the course, hopefully the student has improved through that you know kind of iterative process of, of constant feedback with the instructor. Um, and uh, in some of these grading schemes, uh, one thing that instructors may even do is let students um, grade themselves at the end. I know it sounds a little crazy. Um, I, I was like, what, when I first heard it. But um, the idea is that hopefully students will grow as a result of this process and be able to kind of more um, you know, analytically critique themselves and, and give themselves a score for what you know, they feel that they've earned um, through the semester. And the, um, there's a, a few folks that have written about ungrading and, and they tend to say that students are remarkably, um, you know, 
unbiased, I guess, when they grade, they're remarkably um, good about giving themselves a fair grade and not just saying A, A++, and just going on about their day. So the idea is not that they would just give themselves a score without any kind of rationale. So maybe you would ask students to you know, explain the rationale for why they feel that they've earned a particular grade, and then the instructor would have kind of overview um, or override uh, permission to to change it it wouldn't go straight to the grade book without some intervention there but anyway so that's the the idea so um so these kinds of of grading again are not terribly well supported in um, lms's because the lms is largely based around numbers um, to calculate things for um, calculating grades so um so we started looking at ways that maybe that we could kind of tweak what's happening in the grade book and, and other tools to make it more conducive to um, setting up a, a non-numeric grading scheme. Um, so there's ways you can do this and there's workarounds, but it, they're not terribly intuitive. Um, so the idea is to kind of surface the, the capability to do this um, and make it easier for people without having to kind of think through a logic puzzle on how they're going to set this up and make it a little easier for, for faculty to do. Um, so I'm going to skim ahead through this um, and just talk about kind of some of the different parts of, of what I'm proposing here. Um, so it would happen in stages. It's a big project. It's not going to all happen at once. Um, and so really the first step in the process of making this possible is to um, enable the centralized grading service to accept non-numeric scores. So right now, um, the centralized grading service has, has been kind of in the background. It's been you know, worked on a little bit here, a little bit there. It hasn't quite reached its full potential yet. We were hoping that um, some of this would make it into 23, and I'm not quite sure how much of it will actually, in fact, make it into 23. Um, but it would still be sort of behind the scenes in any case. Um, the assignments tool right now in Sakai does um, allow you to do non-numeric scores. So if you don't send something to the gradebook, you have the option to do pass-fail or check mark um, as a, a grading uh, option. But you can't send those types of scores to the gradebook because the gradebook doesn't accept it. So the first step to this um, solution for non-numeric scoring is to make the grade service um, able to accept those types of, of things. So that's the first step that, again, is kind of being worked on a little bit. Hopefully, we'll make it into 23 or 24 um, at some point, but it's sort of a background process kind of thing. You're not going to see it. It's not going to be terribly visible just yet. Um, when it's available, it will link the, um, the centralized grading service to the assignment tool, which already does sort of that type of scoring. Um, and that's the first tool that will have this option, right? But then after that's done, um, it will be used in other tools that calculate grades. So right now, assignments is the only one that uses the new Sakai grader. The idea is that once this all kind of gels, that it will be, the grader will be available in a tool that assigns grades. Um, um, and I've kind of mapped out a little bit of what some of these labels would be. So, and the types of grading that they're associated with. Um, these types of things you would be able to send again to the gradebook, and they would show um, in a gradebook column, um, not just you know a number score, but you might see you know pass and fail or check mark or meets or does not meet expectations, um, things like that. For holistic, you would be able to do a letter grade as opposed to just a number. Um, now, you can choose to display the course grade as a letter grade um, at the end, but you can't do that for individual assignments. Um, and in the background, it might actually be calculating these as a number anyway to come up with the grade based on your grading schema. But for the end user, if you really want to maintain kind of that, that mindset that they're using a particular type of grading, you want to make it so that the display doesn't constantly remind them that it's a number anyway. Um, so uh, displaying the letters to, to students and faculty in the gradebook would be an important piece of that. 
And then for ungrading, again, that's all feedback except for a final grade for the course typically, but maybe, um, you know, you'd have more, uh, more availability for text input in the grade book as opposed to just the tiny little comment drop down. Um, that's associated with a number in the cell. So maybe a better way to put text input in there for feedback, if that's the only thing that, that the cell contains is feedback. And um, not counting anything as a number, but um, you would have you know that as you go along. And then also if um, we wanted to enable that uh, students assign themselves a, a grade at the end kind of concept, maybe there could be something kind of modeled on peer review um, where students provide a preliminary score and then this, the instructor approves or denies it or changes it um, for the final grade. So that would, that's actually, I don't think I detailed that in here. I can't remember. I might need to add it if I didn't. Um, so anyway, um, so the linkage of that to the different tools is first step. And then once that happens, um, then we would start looking at the different tools to um, update the UI so that there's additional options there. So the first place, obviously, is the grade book would need to be able to display all types of things um, that aren't there now. So I've included a few screenshots here of, of screens that might be needed, um, different types of grading schema that might be needed for different grade books like if you select a specifications grade book maybe you get different options here for grading schema um etc and then other tools and these just kind of go through some of the the main tools that have grades um that it would the drop downs would be a little different and regardless of you know whether it's a number or a non-numeric grade type you could still send it to the grade book sort of thing so um, so that just shows a few of these screens here. So that's kind of the, the you know, the gist of it. Um, I don't want to just me be talking the whole time. So I would welcome um, input or, you know, questions or comments from anybody else. Okay, it looks like the blue button kicked out my screen. Said my connection was a little wonky, so I hope you.
It looks like we lost all but three of us. Yeah, Wilma, Wilma just told me she lost her internet, right? Well, I see Jeremy disappeared as well, right? So <laughs> I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Digital gremlins. <laughs> ah, that's Wilma, good. All right, Bo boss is back. Yeah, carry on, Wilma, carry on. Uh, um, my uh, internet. Yeah flaked out <laughs> so i don't know how much of what i said you guys heard before it kicked me out hopefully most of it um so you said what guys... what do other people think that's what you said and then and okay then silence, well, good. And then, you good. then i just disappeared i got you know yeah. <laughs> scared away by the silence <laughs> <laughs> so does anybody have any thoughts on specs grading or ungrading or how are you using it in your on your campuses have you heard of any of this crazy stuff <laughs> i think in the era of chat gpt this this stuff's a really good idea yeah definitely um, i think in people will start talking about this stuff a lot soon <laughs> yeah yeah i also do really like the idea of trying to have the students you know find to have an built-in way to express what do you feel you earned mm -hmm. based on the effort you put in and the knowledge and skills you've gained. Yeah, kind of critically reflect on their own learning and, and make a case for it. I think that could be really useful for students. Now, how to implement that, I've got no clue, but... <laughs> Anybody else? Leanne, I know um, Jordan was the one who had approached me about, um, you know, how can we do specs grading in Sakai? Are there folks at Pepperdine that you know of that are using that sort of a grading strategy? They have a group. Awesome. Yeah, what I'm thinking is what we might want to do um, is maybe at some point, probably in the fall, because summer is a bad time to try to wrangle faculty, but maybe in the fall when people are back and classes are underway, um, we might do some sort of a focus group um and get some you know faculty feedback on you know what they would like to see in terms of you know being able to do this sort of thing in in the lms you know what tools would they need to make it easier for them and maybe show them some you know concepts of what we're proposing and you know that way they can have something to react to kind of poke holes in it and say no i need this or well that would work but i also need this other thing um so we might need to organize something like that um, when we get a little further down the road. So Adrian, um, not to put you on the spot, but uh, how much of the centralized grading service work were you able to, to do? I know you had started it, but I don't know how much of it actually was able to be completed. I mean, the only, I mean, the only, the only thing I've really completed with it was just basically refactoring all the grading stuff and adding more unit tests and modernizing and cleaning up the code, really. I mean, um, I did some stuff with assignments, mm -hmm. as we all know, because I caused chaos because I took a, I took a radio button out. So, uh, <laughs> 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 so I've got a PR in to put that back. So hopefully that, uh, That'll sort that out, yeah. But uh, the f the first the first stage is to yeah. I've not got any further than that. So we know the steps. I mean, the the, the next step really is to, is just to migrate those types from assignments back into the grading service. Mm -hmm. 
because I think you know a lot of the a lot of the stuff you've spoken about there. Well, a few of those cases are captured, you know, probably by those types that are in assignments now, right? So we want to we want to move those back, codify mm -hmm. them a bit more, you know, um, and then you know you start using those types in other tools as well, basically. So the path the path's pretty clear. Right? The path's pretty clear. Um, it just needs to be bitten off in chunks because it's a big, obviously, yeah. it's a big, it's a big thing to 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 look at holistically, right? So my challenge is just to break into chunks you know and that'll be the first chunk get the assignments logic out of assignments and have have assignments reuse the logic from the grading service you know for like pass fail and all that stuff yeah mm -hmm. yeah the, the nice thing about it is once that logic is in there um then it, you only have to build it once right so it can be used in all those other tools um because it's yeah. pulling from that same service. We just have to, we have to get the other logic out of the tool. So, um, but it's moving to that central place. Yeah, exactly. And I'd, I'd do something like I'd have, I'd, 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 I'd write a web component that actually showed those grading types, right? And then we'd have the web component render in the different tools, like in Samago or, or wherever with the grading types there. So even the, you know, the UI logic will be shared it'll only be, it'll only be done once basically so that's the way i'd approach it i think mm -hmm. yeah because that, that grading panel right you know center grade but whatever all that stuff that that can be the same for every tool really you know or yeah. very very similar do you know what i mean so it, it makes sense for that to be a shared component so we've got the same ui everywhere for, for doing that kind of thing but i've got i've got all these ideas they're all they're all there in my head it's just just got to get get past 23 and then um you know start start thinking about it properly again basically but i i think this i think i think these all these ideas are brilliant and uh like i say you know the, the more you read about things like chat gpt i mean pff, we're not gonna be able to trust yeah. anything that the student just <laughs> submit asynchronously right you know you know you know what i mean like in a, in a kind of yeah. essay format or whatever right it's just <laughs> it's gonna be impossible <laughs> yeah it's gonna be a definite challenge so um anything we can do to make it easier for people to kind of feel that it's actually a person mm -hmm. on the other end, um, that they're yeah, yeah, scoring. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. All right, well, I don't wanna belabor the, the topic if, if folks don't have anything else to um, discuss about it. I, I will just say um, I'm going to touch on a little bit of this in um, my presentation at SakaiCon. So we'll be talking a little more about how you can do it now, um, kind of some of the workarounds for doing some of this in the current state um, without the new functionality, um, but also just kind of uh, hoping that, you know, It'll help inform some of the building for the future. So, but anyway, we'll be talking about a little bit of this and a little bit of how do we tell it's not a chat bot <laughs> taking the course <laughs> for for that uh, presentation. So, hopefully, that will be helpful to folks. Um, all right. So, uh, let me back to the Etherpad, which I have to reopen because it kicked me out. Um, so I do have a few JIRAs on here from last time that we brought over. Um, I guess we'll just take the first one. I don't think we talked about that. I think this was just carried over, but we didn't get to any JIRAs last time. Um, so the first one that I am seeing on there is SAK48775. And that is assignments associated with gradebook item score does not flow back to assignments. Uh, oh, actually, we did talk about this one. Yeah, it's got a note on there. Okay, Thank so my bad. We already talked about that. That was from last time. Okay, so let's see. There's a couple from Alan, but Alan's not here. Um, although I think with his time zone, he probably won't be able to make it. So might as well talk about him. Um, all right, so we'll do the first one, the SAK47555. Five, five, five. 
Okay, so this is Postum. Um, Postum offers a lot of flexibility for non-standard grading approaches, but the reliance on a CSV file um, is awkward and clunky. It's also time consuming. In addition to uploading a CSV file, can an option be made to link to a Google Sheet? Um, you know, I thought this was, this used to be possible. Am I just hallucinating? Or is it like some local customization somewhere? Or does anybody else remember this being part of Sakai at one point? It was a while ago. It was like probably like Sakai 10 maybe. Does anybody me remember that? Okay, so apparently I'm hallucinating, uh, <laughs> but I could have sworn. Wait, did somebody say something? I just said I've only known it to be able to get the CSV files from Excel. Okay. Maybe it was a local thing that somebody did, because I know that I, at one point, tested it with a Google spreadsheet. Um, but even though you could link to it, it didn't automatically update. Like you had to go in and hit like a little refresh button to update the content from the sheet. So it still wasn't ideal. Um, but I do think that something like this, where you could link to an online sheet or even edit in Postum once the original sheet is uploaded, it would be a lot easier so you don't have to constantly keep re-uploading. Um, what do others think? Is, there, is anybody using Postum? I'm not, but one of my instructors is because he does some, I'm going to call it almost like double averaging going on. Mm -hmm. So he... Um, does all of the calculations using Excel formulas and then exports just the values um, as a CSV file and then imports them to post them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, Leanne says she has some faculty that think uh, same group for non-specs grading. Yeah, um, a lot of people use post them as a, a way to present feedback for either specs grading or ungrading because it's more flexible. You can do whatever you want in Excel and just upload the Excel. Um, so, yeah, but I, I think this is a good enhancement if we could make it happen to where you could link to an online sheet um, because it would be nice to just be able to update your Google spreadsheet or have the formulas you know, happen in Google. Um, and then it automatically updates the post on periodically. He suggests every five minutes or, or something. I don't know if it would work with the Google Drive integration, though, um, because the upload isn't like an attachment. Um, the attach menu is where you get the Google integration right now. Um, so I don't know if that could be expanded to include that as an option. I it looks like Sean. it might even work to have it not um, pull from the Google Sheet automatically. Currently, with Postum, um, you could upload sort of multiple iterations and just sort of flag which one is the current one, but the mm -hmm. old one's all still in there. So what if, you know, would it be easier to make it sort of a manual thing? You put in the, you know, you link the Google Sheet, and then you still just have to go into post them and say, you know, grab it. Mm -hmm. It would still be easier to, to click like a refresh button than it would to upload a new version of Excel. Yeah, especially because you could easily just keep that uh, Google Sheet going. And more schools are using you know, Google instead of necessarily having the Microsoft applications. Mm -hmm. 
So you think that it would be better for faculty to, to update, update manually as opposed to having it refresh on a schedule? The problem I see with having it update on a schedule is if the instructor doesn't set the schedule, if that's something set administratively, are we going to be set in a situation where they're working on, you know, mm. updating their Google Sheet and Sakai right. grabs it and makes it available to students before the instructor is ready for them to see that work in progress? Yeah, that's a good point. So having it be a manual thing or a schedule that the instructor specifies per course, that gives them the control again. Yeah. Maybe it could be like an option. Like you could either, either you could update manually, which would be the default. You just refresh it manually or the instructor sets how often they want it to refresh. Well, I will um, make a note on this to that effect after the call because you guys don't need to watch me type. <laughs> um, but I do think that would be a useful enhancement. So maybe we can make it so that the instructor can control the uh, updating. So let me pull this up here. And there's another one from Alan, planning documentation updates with Sakai 23X publish on date. Let's see what that's about. Um, and looking at how to automate course site publishing, would it be able to provide a date, time, along with the third option for publishing a course in site info? adding an option in the backend logic to allow an unpublished course site to publish itself according to time and date specified using the standard date time picker. Um, this would allow an instructor to publish course date. Okay, and he's got a mock-up, he says. Okay, wasn't there, isn't there now an option to do that, to publish on a particular date? Yeah, that's in 23. I'm wondering if from the note above it, if it's um, he's asking for documentation updates to include those cool new buttons. But yeah, this this feature is in 23 now. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I guess I'm a little confused because Oh, okay. Maybe he just wanted to know when that's going to be. Hopefully it will be in the 23 docs. Um, I'll have to double check and see if it's already been done or not. I don't no, off the top of my head. Um, but if it's not in there, I'll make sure that I update the article to include it. Because that's a nice feature. Um, but yeah, it should be in the 23.0 um, help, which has not yet been incorporated. We'll probably get that added like sometime during the first release candidate, whenever that goes. Live. I still have a few other um, updates for the accessibility page and, and a few other things that I want to make sure get in. Um, and then I don't think we'll have everything updated for 23, but we, we always try to hit the most changed things so that the most um, obvious new things are documented and then maybe some of the other ones where it's only very slight changes or just maybe a little bit of styling. We kind of work on those as the next maintenance release comes out. Um, but yeah, so that will hopefully be in when, uh, when 23 actually gets released. Okay, uh, let's see. Here's a note that somebody added, I'm not sure who, 
uh, no Jira because it's hard to duplicate. If users use Samrio tests and quizzes and use the feedback date, if they go in and make changes to settings, the category of grade of the grade book goes to unassigned and moves it in the grade book unless you add it into the grade book independently. Has anybody seen that? Christina, I know you do um, a lot of testing. Have you noticed that? I have not. Jennifer says that she has. Okay. Okay, so is it, it seems tied to the feedback dates. So only a few folks see it a lot. Okay. Well, if, it, if it's something that's regularly happening, we definitely need to get a JIRA created. Um, around it. So I, I think that would be the first step. I don't know what this group can do necessarily unless we get a JIRA to maybe comment on um, or if somebody on this call wants to create the JIRA. I've not actually seen it in action. So if you have seen it, maybe um, you can replicate it. Okay, that would be great, Jennifer, if you guys can replicate it and create a, a JIRA. Um, and that way we can flag it to kind of run it up the flagpole. All right, so that up here. Okay. Um, lessons, questions, fixed width. So let's see what, what that's all about. That's me having a, it doesn't look pretty moment. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, did you put pictures in? Yes. Okay, good, good, good. All right. So this is the questions on the lessons, depending on the length of the question. Okay. Let's take a look. Oh, yeah, that looks yucky. Yeah, check, that's checklist. That's checklist. Checklist items are the same width. Next picture is questions. And that is. Oh, really I see. Okay. Well, this one is still. A <laughs> I hate how it breaks to the next line. But that, that's anyway. a different Jira. And yeah. it was unrelated. I was most I, I had those screenshots from. The pr making the. Uh, Jeer about the spacing. Ah, I okay. Used it to the <laughs> All right. So you would expect that they would always be the same width, right? That's what they do here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, but instead, it yeah. depends entirely on the length of the question text. And I don't think there's any way to set the width. Mm -mm. On Not those. that I found. Yeah. Sure, create a shorter question. Or a longer question. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Just put a lot of spaces in there to <laughs> make it match. Um, yeah, that's definitely uh, an issue because um, it does look a little yucky. And there's really no way for the user to fix it um, other than adjusting the length of the question. So I agree. It's ugly. Um, Does anybody, Adrian, do you have, if, if there's a standard width or if it's like a percent or something or just it, whatever it feels like? I have got absolutely no idea. Yeah. I mean, you can, assign, you can assign it to me if you want and I can take a look, but uh, cause I've, I mean, I've been doing stuff in lessons. Is this for 23? Is it, is it, is it a 23? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is, right. Yeah. I mean, but it looks like it's a problem in earlier versions too. Oh, so it's right, been around right. a little while. All, all the above. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can assign it to me, and and if um, 
if I have problems, if you know, if I haven't got time, I'll I'll try and get Dave Dave Bauer to have a look at it. He's my you know, my fallback position, you know. Okay. <laughs> All right. I just gave you that one. So. Yeah. Cheers. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Not like you don't have enough things on your plate, so appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. All right. No problem. Okay. Cool. Um. Let's see. Do we have enough time to look at this next one? Is this one from you, Christina, the assignments grader one? We've only got about four minutes, so we can save it for next time, or if it's super quick, we can look at it. It's super quick. All right, let's take a quick look then. Generally, um, if you use the classic grader, when you click the next and previous buttons, it does a, it kind of does an automatic save, but not release. Mm -hmm. And in the new grader, when you click the next buttons, if you haven't clicked the save button at the bottom of the grading pane, it discards it. Ooh, yeah, that's a problem. So, so make the next and previous buttons equal to a save and not release like it is on the classic. Yes. That would be very frustrating if you put in a whole bunch of feedback and then hit to the next student and then you lose it all. Yeah. Well, I mean, it does pop up with a warning that says, you know, your changes aren't going to be saved. But if I have to, if using the new grader takes two clicks to save and go to the next student and using the classic grader takes one, which is the better option? Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, fine by me. It's an easy, easy enough change that. I thought I was doing the right thing, you know, by popping up, <laughs> popping <laughs> something up there. Well, it's good. Yeah, it's no, good that you warn people. But... Preventing the accidental data loss. But like I said, just from the user perspective, Classic takes one click to save and go to the next student. Yeah. Greater takes two. Yeah, I suppose, yeah, I suppose it's safe enough, isn't it? It's, it's not a release. So, yeah. Okay, right, fine. Yeah, yeah. send it to me. Yep, yeah, send it to me. I will have a look at that. Cool. All right. Well, we're out of time and I don't want to sign anything else to Adrian today. <laughs> so, um, so thank you guys for, um, for coming to today's session um, and uh, for a lively discussion as always. So um, our next meeting will be in June. It will be, let me look at the date, uh, June 7th. So our next meeting is June 7th, and I don't think we have anything on the agenda yet. So if you have any thoughts for things to talk about, we had a few ideas of you know, additional topics down here. I don't know if anybody wants to pick up one of those. Um, we didn't talk about analytics or the roadmap. That kind of got bumped. So we could pick that up in June. Um, I can see if Josh is available, if he wants to start roadmap stuff that early. Does anybody have any other thoughts on what to do for our next call? We can always just do JIRAs. That's our default. You could take another look at the portal. Yeah. That's a good idea. Why don't we do that? Yeah. So, I've just uh, I've just put the PR in. So, yeah. You visit portal. All right. So yeah, we'll take a good look at the portal next time, um, and uh, and see how those changes look that we implemented um, based on some of the the testing that we had done. So um, and get some good feedback on that. All right. Great. Well, all right, so the top of the hour here, so um, I will let you guys go. Um, have a great rest of your day and rest of your week, and I'll talk to you guys in a few weeks, if not sooner. Thanks, everybody. Cool. See you all.